for our last session of the day, we have an exceptional panel that will focus on the complementary relationship of rehabilitation therapy and exercise. Angela Halpern will be moderating the panel. Angela is a speech language pathologist sorry, and chief clinical officer of LSVT Global. She has extensive experience with the Parkinson's community and serves on PAR's board. Our panel includes Jamie Brindle, Ona Reed, Jenny Junker, and Janelle Mellish. Jamie Brindle is an experienced physical therapist with over 20 years of experience working with people with neurological disorders. Ona Reed, and I hope I'm saying that first name right, is a speech language pathologist and singing voice specialist who works in both outpatient and home health settings working with both pediatric and adult populations. Jenny Junker is a clinical occupational therapist who has extensive training working with individuals affected by PD, and Janelle Mellish, who was inspired by her career with the US Air Force to teach boxing and jujitsu to many individuals, including those with Parkinson's. So let's welcome the panel. Get that clicker too. Get that clicker. Thank you. I'm gonna hand you the hand you the mic though. Well, good afternoon. I want you all to take a fist and stick it straight out, and everybody's got to do it today with me. So the difference between this and a punch. It's going to be simply just the force that we're going to put behind this fist, right? So this is simply just a fist out in the air. To turn it into a punch, what we're going to do is we're going to tighten up that fist. I want you to tighten up the forearm. And then I want you to push the shoulder out and push some energy into it. That's your punch. That force that's going to land on your target, which hopefully it's nobody's nose to today. Um, but as it lands on that target, that's the power of that punch. Before you quickly pull it back, so let's all pull it back, to protect yourself in the boxing world. Good, re uh, relax. Thank you for jumping in that exercise with me. You know, people say the power of punch is just simply that force that lands on your target. And I say the power of punch is much more than that. Because something happens as that punch lands on the target and it, as it transcends into your mind, brings you bravery and courage to fight for yourself and to fight for somebody else. And that's what we want to do today here on this panel is to give us all a little bit more courage and bravery as we fight those symptoms of Parkinson's today together. Because let's just be honest, the deterioration of motor skills, of balance, of speech, of uh, sensory function, threatens to steal the joy from our life. And so it is worth finding the bravery and courage to stand up and fight back. And that's what we hope to do today. My name is Chanel Mellish and I am a boxing coach. A special shout out to my power punch group in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I'm joined with the pa other panelists here today. We're going to walk through how in a community we offer teamwork that can stand beside you as you fight your way through Parkinson's. So I'm going to be talking about some exercise today. So um, we're cruising right through here. Um, so what the research shows is that it's the forced intense exercise that is really what helps fight those symptoms of Parkinson's. There's those three words, and I want to break those down one by one so we can talk about what that actually means. The first one is forced. Now, what does forced mean? I don't think any of us really want to embrace that word. Who wants to be forced in here to do anything? Probably none of us. But what forced exercise looks like is something else of your comfort zone, something that's a little bit harder and farther than you would probably go on your own. And so I want to give you an example of this today. Um, 
if someone wanted to force me to do something today as I'm giving this presentation, uh, let's just say the organizer of the event comes up and she says, you know what, Janelle, we know that your comfort zone is standing on the stage, speaking into the microphone, and that's great, but we want to force you to do something outside of that comfort zone. We wanted you to um, show everyone what it looks to fall flat on your face, but to catch yourself, to not break an arm, to jump up and do maybe like a burpee, and then how about like a one, two, three, two, three, two, one punches? How about that? I would be like, whoa. No, first of all, uh, <laughs> I'm not even dressed for this. And that is way out of my comfort zone. There's a million things that could go wrong. I could even knock myself out probably doing this and the presentation would go downhill real quick. Please convince me why I should do this. And so she would continue and she would say, well, we think that demonstrating something outside of your comfort zone maybe could give a little bit of inspiration to someone sitting in a chair fighting Parkinson's today that needs to know that it's okay to come out of their comfort zone and in a trustworthy environment that they can do those things. And I would say, well, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and then you learn that it's not so bad after all <laughs> probably never do that on my own but being forced outside of that comfort zone is sometimes where we have to go to leave an impact on ourselves or someone else and so we got to go there the second word to that forced intensive exercise is intensity. Lots of times when people think about exercise that's intensive, they think of pure exhaustion, being driven all the way to being exhausted, barely dragging themselves out of the gym. That's not really what we're after. When we're talking about intensive exercise, we want to think of exercise that is going to require our full attention. So that's why like a casual stroll in the park of like chit chatting with a friend probably isn't going to be the exercise that's going to help us with that Parkinson's. It might be fun and it might be good for our mental health, but it's not going to be what we're actually looking for for fighting the symptoms of Parkinson's. And then that last word, exercise. Exercise can be a lot of things. The research does specifically show that boxing is helpful but it doesn't always have to be. If we can apply those same principles to other kind of exercise, I believe we're gonna find the same sort of um, improvement that we would find in boxing. And so I have a grandmother in New Mexico who is living with Parkinson's and she for a long time was involved with line dancing. And we believe that that really held some of those Parkinson's symptoms off for quite a while until she quit. But it was that, forced she was forced to do something out of her comfort zone and then when she got better at something she was going to be forced past that and she would learn the next level it was definitely intensive she had to pay attention she enjoyed it so much she did it for um a competition and she had to pay attention she messed it up there was something on the line she was forced to really get that intensity and of course such good exercise that made her happy. So the challenge is to really find some sort of activity that can bring you joy that's forced intensive exercise. But when we put those three th words together, forced, intensive, and exercise, sometimes that can be very discouraging because again, we don't really wanna be forced. Intensive sounds kind of frightening, and exercise can be a little bit overwhelming for us. And so there's three keys that I want us to talk about today that I think is gonna be beneficial for all of us to embrace a good exercise program. The first one is commitment. You're gonna to have to find commitment to the program. You can't go one day and then quit the next and expect it to help. You're gonna to have to commit to it. You're gonna to have to manage those expectations because 
it is going to be forced. It's going to be outside of your comfort zone. So therefore, you can't expect to go in and win. You can't expect to go in and make it and have it easy. It's the frustration and the intensity that you're going to have to get that's going to be the beneficial. And you're going to have to remember something. That frustration is a win. It's not the outcome. It's the frustration. If you can push yourself into frust frustration mode, that's your sweet spot. And then the third one is building a team. So a team is oftentimes the most important part of this. Because as you walk into a regular gym and no one understands what you're faced with, you may feel the critical eye. You may feel the expectations of people that you can't meet. Finding a team of people that can support you is oftentimes the most important thing you can do for yourself. Whether that's a close group of family and friends that understand what you're faced with, that walk alongside with you, or a group of people that are specific Parkinson's-related group. They may not know exactly what you're walking through, but they're going to understand the basic fundamental of it. And they're going to be able to pick you up when you're down. They're going to be able to check in on you. They're going to know the, the hurdles that you face. And so it's extremely important to find a team that can do that. And I would also encourage you to find a coach, somebody that can push you, somebody that can be your corner man standing in the corner of the boxing ring in that moment where you're facing down an enemy that wants to steal the joy of your life. And you can stare down that enemy and you can hear in the, in the background your coach yelling at you, pushing you, holding you accountable, believing in you, pushing you farther than you ever would have gone. They don't quit on you. They don't get scared. They stay in the corner during the wins and during the losses. That's the kind of team that you want to find. And so we're going to take you through today a little bit of a case study of how we as a panel and in representatives of your all your communities can really help stand in your corner and help fight with you through your Parkinson's. So we're going to take on a mock client. Her name is Evelyn Empowered. Anybody ever know Evelyn Empowered? <laughs> Um, so during our power punch boxing class, we always warm up with doing boxing punches and we'll, we'll call them out working on our speech. And so it'll be like a one, two. And one day I noticed that Evelyn isn't calling those punches as loud as she normally does. And so at the end of class, I take her aside and I say, Evelyn, you're normally my loudest lady here. What's going on today? And she says, you know, I have noticed something going on. And her partner agrees. They've also noticed something. And so I say, well, I'm definitely not able to help you specifically with your speech. But I know somebody amazing in our community that can. A speech therapist is a great resource for you to find help. So as I'm talking to her, um, she notes other symptoms, difficulty putting on her gloves, feeling frustrated over the ability to move in narrow spaces and dealing with the change in flooring. You know, these are small things for her, but they're causing some frustration. And I say, you know what? I think those are definitely worth looking into. And I know that some amazing people in our community and as a team, we can really help support you through this. And so I recommend that she sees an occupational therapist as well as a physical therapist. So welcome to Evelyn Empowered's journey. Okay, so as Janelle mentioned, since she noticed that she was having trouble putting on her boxing gloves, she referred to me, an occupational therapist. So when I see Evelyn, I'll talk about our initial evaluation and some of the things that we did together, but this is cueing me that she's maybe having some trouble with fine motor coordination, so maybe tying the gloves or clasping the gloves. Um, timing and planning of putting her hands into the gloves, being able to have the range of motion to extend when she wants to. Um, and so after I initially um, saw her for the first time, I would do an evaluation with her. I would talk with her and do an interview to see what kinds of things are challenging in her daily life, as well as some assessments with her. So one of them I brought, it's very small, but this would be a fine, an example of a fine motor coordination assessment. So it's this, this is called the nine hole peg test. 
It has little tiny pegs that I would time someone to put in each hole. I would see how long it took them with one hand to put them all in and then to take them all out. And we would do that with both hands. It's an assessment that has norms. So based on her score, I would be able to tell whether that was within functional limits for her age or whether she's having trouble with that. Besides just assessments, I would also ask her, you know, are you having trouble with maybe getting the cap off the toothpaste, opening a new water bottle, opening a jar when you're cooking, little tasks like that, that might, maybe she's noticed a little bit of change, but still is able to do that task. But there are all sorts of different tools out there, as well as just working on strength and coordination to be able to do those tasks. Um, after talking with her and doing an assessment for activities of daily living, which I would probably do something called the modified Barthel index, which I wrote on this slide. It really goes over 10 areas of your daily tasks. So showering, dressing, going up and down the stairs, um, transferring, walking or using a wheelchair, all sorts of different activities and whether you're able to do that independently or maybe you need a little bit of help with that. Um, after I did that with her, Evelyn told me that she would need supervision for those tasks based on her score overall. So she's not having trouble with many things, mainly dressing, like clasping buttons, zippers, things like that. Um, and then as far as I would kind of come in with a holistic approach. So besides just those assessments, I would also probably do a fall assessment, looking at her balance and kind of how she's doing overall to make sure she's safe at home. After talking with a physical therapist, she was also going to do the timed up and go. So I probably wouldn't do that one after all. Um, and then when I was interviewing with her, she was talking to me about different activities and things that are important to her. So she wanted to be able to go to church. She wanted to be able to play with her grandkids and take them to the park. She wanted to be able to get dressed independently. So doing her buttons, putting her pills in her pill box, those sorts of tasks. Um, and then she also wanted to be able to participate in a weekly card group and being able to host that in her home, which has all sorts of different tasks involved. So as you can see, we already have a team approach and PT and OT are often confused and some people don't really know the difference between the two. Um, there is a, a lot of overlap because we see you as a whole person and so we can't just divide it into legs and arms because that's not how we work in real life. So um, physical therapy in general tends to work a little bit more on mobility. So that includes leg strength and function. And occupational therapy usually looks more at activities of daily living and more the upper body and arms, but there is a lot of overlap. Um, so Evelyn's boxing instructor, Janelle, referred her to physical therapy because she was noticing that her feet kind of felt stuck in place at times. It was hard for her to explain, but the PT realized right away what was going on. <clears throat> I had actually seen her before because she had had therapy in the past and she admitted that she had um, canceled her last appointment with me. So I usually have people do little tune-up appointments after I've seen them and have them come back and see me for about every six months. And she felt like she was doing really well because she was involved in this boxing class. And so unfortunately she had canceled that appointment. I'm sure we have all done that thinking, I just don't have time for that appointment. <clears throat> so she felt she was doing well, but now she's realizing that yes, there are some little things that I think might need to be addressed. Um, that feet feeling stuck in place, she was mentioning that she noticed it with turning. And then as we talked more, she also admitted, you know, if I'm in a narrow space, I notice sometimes that happens then. Um, when my children, when I'm out in the community with them and they're telling me, mom, can you hurry up a little bit? That's another trigger sometimes that my feet feel stuck in place. And we call this freezing of feet. So through her physical therapy evaluation, we always have an interview and discuss what she wants to work on because I am just there to help her accomplish what she wants. So I think people are afraid to come to therapy. One, they've heard that we're, um, let's see, physical torturous, um, what else have I heard? Pain and torture. Um, and that is not the case. Really, we're just trying to get you back to doing things that you want to do. We try to make our sessions fun. There's always laughter in my clinic and most people actually look for, forward to coming to their visits. 
So one of the first things that we did is the timed up and go that Jenny had mentioned. This is a very standard test. Um, it's a quick balance screen, and so it's often done um, on the first visit. So I'm gonna have Jenny be Evelyn for us, and I'll just demonstrate that for you real quick. <clears throat> So Jenny slash Evelyn, um, this is the timed up and go task. I would like you to stand up as quickly as you feel comfortable. You're gonna walk about 10 feet. This is not accurate today. Um, walk about 10 feet, walk around my water bottle, come on back, turn around again and sit down. And I'm gonna time you on that, but don't go any faster than you feel comfortable. Okay, let me get my stopwatch ready. I'll give you a ready, set, go. Ready, set, go. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> so Jenny did that in 7.8 seconds. Um, that is a very normal score. There are norms for this test as well, which just means that it is a research-based test. So it's been studied um, across multiple ages. And what they have shown is that if it takes you longer than 13 and a half seconds, you're considered at risk for falling. So depending on her score, I looked back since I had seen her before and saw that that time had declined from the last time she was there. I also noticed that as she went around the water bottle that she started to have some short shuffling steps. She didn't have a true freeze until she came back to the chair and her feet kind of got stuck in place and she started reaching forward for the chair and kind of threw herself in. So there was a lot that I could see in that quick test that showed me that we need to work on some balance and mobility. Um, so I've kind of addressed some of the things that are up there that we noticed. I also noticed that her arm swing when she's walking had decreased. It's normal for us to walk with our arms swinging to some extent and she was only swinging one arm. So that was another thing I wanted to address. Um, her walking speed had decreased as we talked about. Her posture was a little bit more slouch than I had seen her last time. And then I did another balance test called the mini best test and that score had also decreased indicating that she was at risk for falls. So giving her feedback from that, she then felt empowered to continue with treatment with me. Next up is speech therapy. So uh, Evelyn was referred to speech because um, of that initial observation that she was having difficulty. Um, she was quieter than she normally is calling out those punches. Um, so Janelle suggested that she look on the PAR website um, to look up a speech therapist um, that she could work with. And the speech therapist myself um, would work with her to get a referral from an MD, that's important, for speech therapy. Um, can I get the clicker? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, <you're kidding. laughs> Thank you. Um, so during our evaluation, when she got into my office, uh, we had an interview. I talked to her about how does your voice sound? Are you noticing any changes in your voice? Usually, um, the her partner said, yes, definitely. They're not talking to me as much. They're much quieter than they used to be. Um, and Evelyn said that she feels like she's being ignored more and she has to have to repeat herself and that makes her pretty frustrated. Um, in addition to that, Evelyn feels like her voice is really fatigued and tired at the end of the day. And when pressed, um, she's having some difficulty swallowing pills you know, those really big ones and sometimes the small ones um, and some occasional coughing when she drinks water. So we take all of that information and then I collect voice data. Um, so we have, we kind of do a whole bunch of different voice data. I'll have them take a nice deep breath, say, ah, for as long as they possibly can. Um, have them read some sentences, tell me about a happy memory. And then I'll have them do some speech tasks while they're problem solving. So this can look like, okay, I want you to read these sentences and I want you to be writing down some math problems or solving these math 
equations while you're telling me these sentences. Um, sometimes I have them uh, tell me about their day while sorting a deck of cards. Um, and what I noticed in all of these data is her voice became hoarse, probably because of that low breath support. Um, also, I record all of these things and play them back to Evelyn saying, okay, let's listen to you again. And one thing that Evelyn notices is that her voice was actually much worse or much worse and quieter than she thought. She thought she was talking at a normal loudness and didn't understand why I wasn't understanding some things. So that was um, a pretty good aha moment. A lot of times I see, I get people in my clinic of uh, spouses, caregivers, family, saying I can't understand them and my patient, Evelyn in this case, doesn't hear that. So that mismatch um, and that audio recording playback was important for her. I also do an in-office swallowing exam. So that's eating um, and drinking. So drinking water, eating applesauce, maybe a cracker. Um, and in that exam, I see there's an increase in the time that food and liquid comes to the back of the throat. There's also a decrease in coordination of the muscles used for swallowing. So because I can't see into Evelyn in my office, I recommend a swallow study for us to really visualize what is going on. And this, I'm having technical difficulties. That's the button. Okay, um, so in our speech therapy sessions, my goal is for increasing vocal loudness to a normal level so she can be heard in things that are important to her in her boxing class, book club, family dinners. Her partner told me that she was a hilarious woman and she's not telling jokes like she used to at family dinner. Another goal is strengthening her voice so she does not feel fatigued at the end of the day. So working on that endurance so she can participate in conversation for family dinner and implementing safe sw swallowing strategies. And these will be more um, thorough and specific once we get the results from that swallow study. So for her swallow education, um, I also want to uh, point out these are very vague. There is a handout in the empowerment bar that has more swallow strategies and also things to look out for if you are concerned about your swallow at all. Um, so I recommend that Evelyn reduce distractions, um, really turn off that TV, really focus on that swallow, making, she's chew making sure she's chewing thoroughly. Um, for her pills, uh, putting the pill in applesauce or pudding or yogurt can help uh, make that swallowing easier and follow the other strategies that you can look at in the empowerment bar. For our sessions, uh, I we will be utilizing research-based voice therapy exercises and we will be incorporating the principles of neuroplasticity. These specifically have been shown to show benefit for people with Parkinson's. So they're very important. Uh, so the treatment would be intensive, four days a week uh, for about um, an hour for four weeks is the recommended dose. So multiple sessions, high effort. So you're not coming in and we're just gonna, you know, talk about the day. We're really high effort, uh, really using, um, building up that intense, uh, intensive forced exercise, right? Um, so our voice exercises are to increase a voice to normal loudness levels. So we'll be doing again that ah, uh, but now loud ah, uh, nice high loudness, right? Um, giving a lot of visual body cues to make you nice and loud. Um, we'll be increasing the strength and coordination of the muscles in your voice. So you can talk for longer periods of time. And um, I would be giving Evelyn the home exercise program. So she's practicing these skills at home and she's not just working when she's in the office with me. 
the most important piece is that all of the things I do are salient to Evelyn. My reading materials, my treatment materials mean something to her. So Evelyn told me in our interview, um, usually the interview is pretty long, that initial evaluation with me. Um, so she goes to book club, she goes to boxing class, um, and she does jokes. So at our first session, we come up with phrases that she says in those important moments in her life, and we work on her loud, intense voice um, every time. So one phrase for book club would be, which character do you like best? What did you think about chapter five? For her boxing, forgive me if I butcher this, jab. <laughs> one, two, uh, left hook. So she can call out those punches in class. For jokes, we could say something like, how much fun is doing your laundry? Loads. <laughs> <laughs> so things that really bring Evelyn in, so it's meaningful to her, and that it's more likely to carry over into her life. Okay, so now she's on to her PT treatment for that week. And to address the um, movement patterns that we saw that need to be improved, one of the things that we're gonna work on is some multi-directional stepping activities, really working on those bigger motions, that weight shifting, um, because when she freezes, one of the main reasons is because she's not shifting her weight onto the opposite leg to take that step. So that's really gonna help with that freezing of gait. Um, we also work on, gait just means walking. So walking training, emphasizing bigger movements, bigger posture, bigger arm swing. And we're gonna start out simple. We're just gonna walk across the gym. And then she's got that down pretty well. Okay, well, most of us don't just walk and don't do anything else. So then we start introducing, can you hold a conversation with me? Can you name me categories of animals or fruit or vegetable? Um, can you carry something while you're walking big? So we really keep increasing that challenge as she um, gets better at activities. We work on prevention techniques for freezing, and we also work on recovery techniques for freezing. So one of the most important things is when you notice that your feet are not moving, we do not want to keep going because what's gonna happen? My feet are frozen, my upper body is just gonna keep going and I might end up falling. So the first thing when you notice that your feet are stuck is you need to stop. So there's four S's. We stop, we stand tall, we shift our weight a couple times side to side to get those feet unstuck and then we take a big step and get going again. We also work on transfer training, which just means getting out of a chair, getting in and out of bed. Um, the biggest thing that we noticed with her was those small turns. So we're working on wider turns as she turns to that chair. And obviously we work on balance training, many ways to do this. We work on eyes closed, we work on uneven surfaces to mimic the grass. I actually take my um, patients outside most of the time. We have some areas around my clinic where we can work on real life situations. Um, we have balance boards, kind of the sky's the limit with that. <clears throat> we do incorporate some of her boxing moves as well so that we're addressing her desire to continue with her boxing program and that's really encouraged because I don't expect her to stay with me for a lifetime. She really needs to learn what I have to teach her and then apply that in the real world, including to her boxing class. Um, sometimes I am working on Nordic walking with poles, so just hiking poles. Even for some of my patients that don't need a walker or a cane, Earlier on in the disease process, it's been shown that we can stand much taller and we can walk with bigger steps when we feel balanced. And those poles can be really helpful when you're out and doing your cardio, you're walking for exercise. Um, so she admits that she had fallen off her home exercise program. I'm sure we have all done that. 
Uh, she said, I thought that the boxing was covering everything I needed to do. And I said, I am so happy that you are still doing the boxing class, but I need you to still work on your big movements all the time. If we don't use it, we start to lose it like everything else. <clears throat> okay, for her OT treatment sessions, um, kind of as um, everyone's been mentioning, we're gonna focus on large exaggerated range of motion and movements. So instead of our feet doing steps and things like that, we're gonna use our hands. I'm gonna show you some exercises in a minute. Um, we're also gonna create and educate Evelyn on a home exercise program. So she might be thinking, well, I already exercise. I do my own thing, I go to boxing class. Well, we're gonna make an individualized program for her based on the things she's struggling with. So this is gonna include some of the movements that I'm gonna show you, and this is gonna address the hypokinesia, which means like the minimal small movements she might be doing, and also emphasize her the high intensity for long lasting change. Okay, so I want everyone to try these few things. So the first one would be a fist to extending your hands big and wide. So I would just have her do that 10 times. We'll do five. One, two, everyone say it with me, three, four, five. Great. The next one is called apple picking. So you're gonna pick an apple, big hand, pick the apple and across your body into the bucket. So we'll do three each side. How about one, two, three. Okay, let's do the other side. So nice big hand across to our bucket. One, two, three. Great. The next one is making hamburgers. So if you have ground beef, you're gonna make a hamburger like a ball. So we're gonna do this back and forth. So we're moving one hand on top and going back and forth. Let's do three. One, two, three. Great, y'all are expert hamburger makers. The next one is rock, paper, scissors. Does everyone know rock, paper, scissors? So it's a fist, straight like a piece of paper, and then a scissor, so like the number two to the side. So we would do rock, paper, scissors. Then let's do the other hand. Rock, paper, scissors. Great. Um, the next one would just be thumb opposition. So touching each finger to your thumb. As that becomes easy and you get the hang of it, I want you to go as fast as you can, working on that speed as well and the coordination. Good. Um, and then lastly, I might have her put her hands on the table and lift one finger up at a time. It's actually more challenging to do than it seems. So again, as you kind of get the hang of it, some of our tendons are connected, so it's harder to do individually, but go as fast as you can with that as well. Um, I would also educate her on doing some of these tasks or these exercises before she's completing difficult tasks, like maybe doing buttons or doing a zipper. I would say, let's do a couple of these exercises to kind of prep your hands and your body to move. Um, and then, our treatment might also involve playing cards or games that might involve small pieces in the coordination, um, just different movements that might carry over into her everyday life. Um, we might work on dressing tasks as well. Oh, I can go to the next one. Um, and then we are, we're gonna actually practice putting on the boxing gloves and see what's challenging about that task specifically and how can we make that easier for her. And then also I want to emphasize that we would repeat a lot of these things. So repetition is important for neuroplasticity and getting our brain and to do what our body is trying to do. So our brain's telling our body to act. It might not be acting like we want, but we got to repeat to kind of work towards that goal. And then if, you know, some dressing tasks are maybe still challenging, I might educate her on some modifications we could make. There are all sorts of tools and technology out there these days but even like a button up shirt, now they have magnetic closures. So it looks like a button up shirt, but it has a magnet. Um, sometimes you can just sew Velcro in there. So all sorts of different things. There's also like a zipper pull, which is basically just like a string attached to the zipper to put your hand in and pull up and down and a button hook as well if buttoning is still difficult. So when would she be done with occupational therapy? So after about four to six weeks, she would be discharged once she's met her functional goals. Um, she would be compliant with her home exercise program. We can modify it and we would probably upgrade it as we're seeing her in those four to six weeks. And then I would want her to continue with boxing class. So she's already been doing that throughout our treatment, but that's one of the things we wanna emphasize that she's still doing that exercise and activity. I, we would want her to know that the whole team is here for her, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech. 
if she needs, you know, a tune-up or whenever she needs, whenever she needs us. Kind of like Janelle said, we're all her coaches on her team. Um, we want her to know that she is empowered to seek help when she needs it. And hopefully she notices how much easier it is to get her boxing gloves on. And then I would also talk with Janelle about the techniques that we've used to help her work on these tasks, specifically getting her gloves on and off during class. And if she's struggling, maybe some of those exercises she could do and prep for that activity. So before I go on to this discharge slide, I realize I forgot to have you do my fun exercise. So <clears throat> I'm gonna show you one of the great ways to kind of work on posture and um, bigger movements. So I'd like you all to scoot to the edge of your chair, sitting up as nice and big and tall as you can. I want your feet nice and wide, at least shoulder width apart. And we are going to reach forward. You may find that one hand doesn't want to go as far as the other. See if you can get them equal. Then you're going to reach down big towards the floor as far as you feel like you can. I'm going to lose my mic. Then we're going to look up, go up towards the ceiling. Good. And then back behind you, really sticking your chest out. And we're going to hold that for a count of 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and back. Good, let's do it one more time. We're reaching out big, down big, up big, and back big. And hold for 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, and back. Great job, guys. You're ready for my class. Come join me. Okay. So Evelyn has met all of her goals that we created together. She is back to using her home or doing her home exercise program. Um, she wants to return. She wants to return. Oh, no. Okay. She wants to return to her weekly boxing class, and she's so excited to remember that PT is always there for her. I tell her this is kind of a lifelong relationship. I expect her to come back in for tune-ups whenever she needs to, and I'm always there for her. She really is happy to have that team approach to care, and she feels empowered to seek help when she needs it. And we set up a reassessment visit in six months just so I can retest some of the tests and make sure she's doing great. And if not, we can add in a few sessions. I did want to speak quickly about other things that PT can be helpful for because just because you have Parkinson's doesn't mean you might not have other issues that PT can be really helpful for. So what we often get the question of, I exercise, but so why do I need to see a PT? And one of the main things is that maybe you have some pain. Maybe you have an orthopedic issue. You have some shoulder pain, some back pain that's limiting you from exercise. PT are the musculoskeletal ep uh, experts. So come and see us. We can help with that. Um, another specialty area, I'm a vestibular trained therapist. And what that means is inner ear, um, your vestibular system is your inner ear. So I see a lot of people with Parkinson's and people without Parkinson's that have dizziness and vertigo. And oftentimes they don't think of therapy as being helpful for that, but we can be very, very helpful um, with vertigo or dizziness. So those are some other reasons that you might seek out PT, not just for your Parkinson's symptoms. Evelyn is discharged from speech therapy. Yay, after four weeks. Um, and she is independently louder uh, with her family and friends at dinner in her boxing class. This is always a great day. Um, she feels empowered and like a vital part of conversations. And we know that being part of that conversation really boosts that quality of life. Um, so she's feeling empowered. Um, during book club, she feels confident about her ideas and she's been putting herself out there more in that way. Uh, she feels like her old self and realizes that people weren't ignoring her. She was, they just couldn't hear her. And that's a big thing that we work on in speech therapy is that sensory mismatch. We're recalibrating you um, to understand what your new normal loudness level is for other people too. Um, and Janelle told Evelyn how impressed she is that she can hear every call 
when she counts out her punches at class. And that's a pretty good thing as far as a speech therapist hears. I like when other people notice the good progress. So yay, Evelyn. Oh, and we got her MBS, her swallow study back, by the way, um, and she met all of her therapy goals. Um, so that's great. So she's met everything and she, I discharged her with, um, we set up that six month tune up session um, just to check in to see that she's still doing great. Um, really encouraged her that we are a team and that I'm always there for her no matter um, where she is in her progress. I loved um, just the little tune ups just as much as the big four week therapy sessions. So to summarize, um, therapy and exercise. In Parkinson's disease, there is hypokinesia. Uh, we've spoken to this in all of our disciplines. Um, it's a decrease in amplitude in muscles for voice and speech, also in that fine motor movement and your big gross motor movement. Uh, speech therapy can improve the amplitude of muscles for the voice while physical therapy and occupational therapy help retrain that normal movement uh, for the bigger um, amplitude and also those fine motor movement tasks. So beyond motor movement, uh, motor changes, there is also that sensory mismatch that I spoke to earlier. Uh, therapy needs to address this as well uh, for generalization to help retrain the sensory system. So we need to retrain that system uh, so you don't need us all the time. <laughs> Um, we love to see you, but we want to make you as independent as possible um, so you can independently use that louder voice on your own. Uh, you can independently use those bigger motor movements on your own. So I use vocal recordings. Um, I record you. Was that loud enough? No. <laughs> Let's do it again. Louder. Um, getting less and less cues from me or your partner or your caregiver or your family. So why would you need therapy if you're already exercising? We kind of spoke to this already, but really um, therapy addresses the functional component of movement. So it's individualized to you. It's not just in a group doing the same exercise or activity. We also use evidence-based practice. So there's a lot of research based on specific movements and specific high effort, high intensity activities that helps you actually retrain your brain and recalibrate as Ona said. We also look at other areas and intervention techniques besides just exercise. So we might look at your cognition. Like Jamie said, maybe we're having you do a dual task, meaning you're moving and thinking about other things, or you're having to repeat things or talk about different, um, come up with things in different categories and things like that. Um, one to two hours of therapy a week really just isn't enough if you're only doing therapy. So we really want you to be exercising as well. So I know we all kind of mentioned a home exercise program or things, exercises that we might give you on top of just your therapy session. Um, kind of like I said, research shows that high intensity and high effort exercise is medicine. So besides the actual physical medicine you're taking, exercise can also be medicine for Parkinson's. Um, therapy isn't something that you'll need forever, but it's something like we mentioned, you might need a tune-up. So maybe you need it initially, then you kind of meet your goals and you're doing okay for a while, then you need a check-in and you need a little tune-up and that's okay. And then also we can address other things. So we can address your pain, your dizziness, your cognition, whatever else might be preventing you from doing the exercise or activities that you want and need to be able to do. Okay, <clears throat> so in the ideal world, we think of therapy as the dental, as a dental model. You go to see your dentist every six months for a quick checkup, make sure everything's going okay. Sometimes you need a cavity filled, which is a big bummer, but sometimes you do fine and you get to leave. So that's kind of how we look at it. We want you, we really want to see people as soon as they are diagnosed with Parkinson's. We get to spend more time with you than your neurologist does. Um, I feel like we are a great source of edu education and information for you. So we really wanna give you information on the disease process, prevention of impairments right off the bat, community resources available like PAR, and treatments available. <clears throat> so 
we're here whenever you need us, but usually we do um, recommend that you come to for a check-in about every three to six months, depending on what your therapist feels is best for you. And just know that we want to address the things that are meaningful to you. So really, we are just a resource um, to help you live your best life. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. To, oh, did you have a final? Oh, no, you're good. Okay, I was just going to open it to questions. Did you have another comment? I was going to open it, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's just give a nice round of applause for our wonderful panel. And um, we now want to open it up for questions. And so if, if you have a question, you can either raise your hand and I can run over to you. I'll then figure out which one of our panelists might be best to address that question. Or if you want to write your question down, hold it up, we can grab it. So we'll be looking for any, okay, there's a question over here. I'll get my big movements in <laughs> as I get around the room. All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that um, my wife has been telling me is that I don't talk loud enough. And, um, you know, in the past, before I got Parkinson's, I had the loudest voice in the room. Um, <clears throat> and so, but when I'm speaking to her, I have hearing aids. And when I talk, it sounds really loud to me. And so I'm like, well, what do I have to do to get it to you? I, you know, I'm, it's almost like I'm screaming at her to make it set, work out so she can hear me. Um, any suggestions on, you know, how that I can make that work? Oh, no, I think this one's for you. Yep, <laughs> mine. Um, I would recommend uh, coming in to see a speech therapist. Um, a lot of it is that recalibration that we were talking about. You're speaking to it a lot. Like, it feels loud, right? It feels like I'm screaming, <laughs> uh, but it's not what is being heard. So we can work on that um, really recalibrating you to understand what your new normal is. Um, so there's not one like quick trick I can tell you right now, but I think uh, going through a course of speech therapy would really help with that. And it'll help that frustration. So you're not thinking your wife is just losing her hearing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. There was another question in the middle, wasn't there? Did someone have something? I saw somebody. <laughs> I'm getting my exercise in, I need it. <laughs> Um, so what if somebody went through the uh, the speech program, the loud, years ago when first diagnosed, and now things have changed, progressed, mm -hmm. and, and the same thing for physical therapy. Um, what do you recommend, going through it again? Or if not, how often for additional speech therapy would you recommend? How many hours a week? Or what do you, for both groups? Ona, do you want to start with the, and then maybe Jamie, you can talk about physical therapy, and maybe if you guys both could talk about loud for life and big for life, too. Yeah. That was my thought. <laughs> um, so I would have them come in for another evaluation just to see where they're at. Uh, it might, depending on what we're hearing, it might be that they just need a couple tune-up sessions, and then I can send them on to a loud for life group or a voice exercise group that meets once a week and they can really, uh, helps with accountability, it helps with having that support and really practicing those speech exercises consistently in a group. Um, but it really depends on how, uh, what level they're at. Uh, they might need another full course, but I bet some tune-up sessions and that uh, Loud for Life group would be beneficial. Um, so since we've talked a little bit about LSVT Loud, and LSVT Big. Um, let me explain a little bit about that. It is a treatment approach that all of us here um, do use. And it's not the only approach out there, but it's very helpful. So as we talked about, it's very intense. Okay. Um, and it's one hour treatments, one-on-one -on -one with the therapist for four days in a row, for four weeks in a row. Um, 
So we are really changing the way that you speak and the way that you move. And LSBT Big can either be a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. And we address both um, the full body in those sessions. So it's not like you have to see a PT and an OT separately. If you see a PT for LSVT big, we're gonna address both of those issues and vice versa if you see an OT. Um, so I have seen quite a few people go through that program and then they really are expected to continue these exercises for life. That is very daunting. Does any of us do the same thing every day that we did 20 years ago? Probably not. So. There's ways to help you stay motivated with that. So Big for Life and Loud for Life are a continuation in a group setting. So it is a group exercise class that you have to have already gone through the one-on-one -on -one session so that you know the exercises, you're familiar with the exercises, and then we get to have fun with it. So I love my Big for Life class. Um, it's once a week. It makes people stick with their home exercise program, and then we make it very entertaining. We have um, different themes. If it's a holiday, we had an Easter egg hunt for one example. We can really use big movements with just about anything. So it's much more interactive with the class and you get to be around other people that um, are dealing with the same issues. So that's a great way to stay motivated and keeping moving. But like we said, if I finish an LSVT big program or I'm sure an LSVT lab program, we do set up a three to six month follow-up after that. And I continue to do that so that I'm realizing when they are starting to have a decline, they might need to come back for a few sessions or, or at times I have gone through the whole program again, but that's very individualized based on what the patient shows up needing. Okay, thank you so much to the panel. Let's give them a big round of applause.